Welcome to Elk. How many people? What? Turn on the screen! Uh, we lost it. I? It was on, I promise you. <laughs> wake up, wake up. Mr. Projector? Mr. Projector? Hello, Mr. Projector? Oh my gosh. Well, apparently the demo gods are really going to be laughing and laughing. Someone should really just have a laugh track for me going back there. Aaron? No? Uh huh. I'll believe that. All right. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Starting over. No, no, just continuing. So, Elk. How many people here have have used Elk? Like actively use Elk? This is really cool because I was actually hoping that, that there'd be a, a subtle majority or a, a minority anyway. So I want to try and hopefully grow that in this crowd and to where you're like, oh man, I uh, got this data log of uh, all this GPS information, all this stuff I've tracked throughout the US or in my city or in my neighborhood. And, and I want to go ahead and create statistics about this. I want to be able to write a report. I want to have CSVs. I want to I have data and use it. That's where 101 starts, is we're getting the introduction done. I plan on doing more of these, and it'll be better. I, I'll get better at this, if you let me. All right, so next slide. Agenda, we're gonna introduce our environment. We're gonna go over Python. A lot of this uses Python. We're gonna go over what the data looks like once you actually import it via uh, Python. We're gonna use a CSV file to do that. I found a giant, huge CSV file. Uh, over six million records. It took approximately, line. it did one by one, I didn't try and do any crazy threading, bulk insert stuff. One by one, it took roughly 36 hours to complete. All right, so then we're gonna use file beats. And technically not file beats, I haven't updated this yet. We're taking this stuff straight from syslog. Syslog is directly touching logstash. Logstash is just throwing it into Elk. It's probably into Elasticsearch, as it were. All right, so we're gonna go over some of the Grok stuff that happens, which is really where, in any of these, you end up having to parse the data. You end up having to take elements, assign it to text, assign it to int, long, so on and so on. So you're, we're gonna go ahead and get pretty, a little detailed. I have a GitHub also. <laughs> Joel, I did make this. <laughs> That's what, I won't finish that. Um, so uh, yeah, I have a GitHub as well. I saw Joel's very genius method of sharing that, went ahead and did it. Uh, so if you guys want to, you can go ahead and capture it. Otherwise, I'll be happy to share it later. All right. I added this, uh, I'm a, I do music stuff, so this reads, may the music passing through this device somehow help to bring just a little more peace to this troubled world. And I really think that's a very core philosophy that I try and live by, and I wanted to go ahead and just kind of share that, and hopefully this helps you. Inspirational! <laughs> I try. All right, so introduction environment. I'm using Windows 10, uh, Python, both versions, 2.7 and 3. Point whatever. Breaker in 2.03, VirtualBox, and L5.6.8. All right, Python is a beast. Uh, if you've used Python, you'll realize that all it takes is a module include, and you can, uh, you have uh, uh, anti-gravity, include anti-gravity, or, or actually import, import anti-gravity, done, you're floating. All right, so uh, it helps to have made a few of these, so that way you start working through a troubleshooting methodology. Uh, that has been key in getting this going. The only reason why I've been even able to make this talk is because I've made about four different elk environments so far, and each time it was a learning exercise, looking at the logs, finding out where it went instead of where I was trying, I wanted it to go. And uh, I, like, you will fail your first time trying to get data into elk, you will. Uh, just pick yourself back up, look at your logs, look, do your Google searches, you'll figure it out. Hopefully this talk helps you through most of that. Uh, time date formatting. When is that never an issue? But it is an issue here, uh, so you're going to have to import a couple modules to go ahead and work with it. Uh, so you've got to identify the useful fields in your CSV, format each of those elements accordingly, otherwise you're not going to be able to search correctly. It's going to think everything is a string, because that's how it is in a CSV. It's all quoted, all strings. So you actually have to do some manipulation to go ahead and bump that down to, say, an int or a long or whatever.
whatever data set. If you're wanting a, a GeoPoint, which is a really difficult data field to make. And then uh, the other one is a, uh, an IP address, an actually typed IP address. So, uh, so then you, uh, you have to set your index, your mapping, which I sort of just talked about, and your settings, which covers like how many shards you're actually supporting within that data set. Uh, are you having a cluster and you only want it on shards on one edge of that cluster? You can assign all of that right here while you do it. All right, so what is behind door number three? We're going to find out. Let's go ahead and actually go to our data set. And this is the wrong data set. So one second here while I pull this up. All right. So I have a data folder that is not synced. So I don't have to upload six whatever million lines out to the internet. So this is a pretty hefty file right here. Uh, let's maybe try and, oops, let's appropriately get out of that. And we're going to, actually I'm going to set down the microphone because I don't type well with one hand. Does this work? It works. All right. So if you're familiar with uh, Windows or, or uh, Bash in Windows, this is how you go ahead and get to your directories. So uh, I'm gonna browse to this Git. Just I wanna show you the, the first elements, that way you can actually see the, uh, the first lines. So we're gonna head that file. So there's an example of your data. Uh, fun enough, I'll see it. Uh, CSVs are probably the easiest easiest data to go ahead and import because you actually have headers. You know what all of your fields are labeled. This is incredible. Uh, there's other types that have this as well, but CSVs, it's just primarily easy to go ahead and get that information. All right, so what I did was I wrote an importing engine. Make sure I, that light really does give you a, uh, a difficult time about seeing what you're actually, okay, I'm on the right one already. So. What we did in this CSV is, I, uh, I basically load in uh, data sets. So I load in a username and password for connecting to Elk, because if you've installed Elk correctly, do I have a question already or? No, okay. Uh, so when you use Elk, and specifically this Elk, I should probably take one step back further and let's, uh, let's get into our Vagrant. So I have Vagrant right here that, uh, that I'm running. Now this Vagrant installation uh, allowed me to, and let's open up that in its own window real quick here. And I need to access you and Elk, Elk. There we go, all right. So what we have here is a Vagrant file that sets up several core forwards. 9200 for your access to uh, Elastic, 9300 for SSL based, uh, 5601 for connecting to Kibana, that's how you, your, your UI basically, your graphical UI. Uh, I have set 5000 TCP and UDP so I can get syslog data. Um, you can set that to another port, uh, 514, whatever. It's important that you go ahead and forward it into your VM, otherwise you'll never see it. All right, so then I go ahead and configure this guy with eight gigs of RAM, four cores, and then I went ahead and started him up. So he's running right there, uh, sitting on a, a pretty hefty amount of data. So what I did was uh, let's switch back to him. All right, so you, I've got the username and password for connecting to Elk, and I've actually got it saved in the config file. Uh, I go ahead and, and use an index name from the import, and so I, this actually will allow you to import groups of CSVs. If you have a folder with CSVs in it, all you have to do is list the folder name. It'll iterate through the CSVs on its own. They do all have to have the same structured data set. Outside of that, you're good to go. So, uh, and you, you obviously have to set up the structured data set. So I finally learned how to map and seed the map from the Python. So here's our body mapping. We have properties, we have each field name and the actual data type for the field name. 
and then we have body settings where we actually set the number of shards and the number of replicas. So then I try and create this data set. I catch the exception if anything happens, and then I start the load process. So the load process is this function right here. It'll actually show you what number it's on as it does the import. It's, I'm pretty proud of all of this. Uh, so once it gets done importing all the data, uh, you actually have, let me switch to the correct index here, U.S. crime. Uh, this is uh, it's U.S. crime for Chicago, uh, 20 years ago to today, roughly almost about uh, last week is the last data point. So we have 6,500,000 records. The neat part about this is we can go to visualize and we can actually see that data set. And yes, my phone is hosting a wireless network so that way I can pull on the map. Otherwise it, it would just look really plain. Uh, so you can go ahead and zoom in on, uh, on about any field area here. It automatically resizes the dots and points. You can see which point is actually causing, or where the most, most uh, activity is. And it's incredibly basic as far as, as activity description goes uh, for that view. So I did go ahead and, uh, and make some other neat views out of this data just because, I mean, how often do you have almost 7 million records of, of uh, crime in a city? Um, here we have the locations with crime literally sprayed out. You can go ahead and see that they started sorting crime differently uh, versus street versus uh, sidewalk. Sidewalk became something at some point and then they, they started filtering accordingly. I found that pretty interesting. A lot of times I find you, what you see in the data is how they changed how they're getting the data in the first place. Uh, you also made one for primary type. So these, uh, these are really pretty easy to make these uh, views, once you have the data in here, you can go ahead and actually go to visualize. Uh, you can say that you want a, and let's just, I'll start trying to make one for example. Uh, so I want to make a, uh, a heat map, inevitably is what I've been making here. And so in the heat map, um, you go ahead and say on your x-axis, you want that to be a histogram, auto, and then you go ahead and basically say, what term do I want to for, uh, sort on? And I want to go ahead and sort on primary type. And then it just does all the rest of the work for you. Brilliantly easy. Uh, you can actually go ahead and pop down a menu here and you can download a formatted version of this data. And so that way you have a brand new CSV Excel file and you can just go ahead and edit and work with it right there. I just realized I've been talking pretty quiet. All right, so, uh, so that's, in a nutshell, how you go ahead and work with uh, a known data set, uh, something you're not trying to make yourself. Now we're going to go ahead and move into trying to work with, with Joel's data. This was, uh, to say the least, um, a challenge. And uh, all right, let me see if I can put this up just for a second while I, I maneuver for the next view. One sec. Jaeger? Yeah. yeah! You got it! Misery loves company! <laughs> <laughs> the best company. Yeah, Jaeger works really well, by the way. <laughs> All right, so I'm watching the actual log stash, uh, a plain log file. What happens in this file is that anything that should be, anything that happens in uh, Logstash ends up filtering to here and all your error messages, any of its stuff that actually happens. And since I'm going to go ahead and try and show this in a, a very, very useful way, let's go ahead and do a restart on actual Logstash. So we're going to stop Logstash. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, restart it. Start following the the uh, log so that way you can see it actually start. And once you see it start, uh, we'll try and put some data in there. 
So let's get back on our view. All right. That error message is just a shutdown error message. I do the N30, that way I, I like having a, a, a running view, so I, I see what happened and then what built from it. All right, so what happens here is it, uh, it runs, all right, let me see if I can get back to the very beginning. Okay, so here's the first initialization module. Um, this Elk installation is, is basically weaponized. He's already put a metric system, uh, a NetFlow system, and a, uh, a uh, what was it, a CPU beats, a comp beats or something, for taking uh, statistics and, and runtime statistics from Windows, Linux, and so on. So CPU, memory, hard drive, all the fields and actual data sorting is already built into this. I didn't even try and use any of it for this talk, but I'm gonna be exploring it. This Elk, this Elk Vagrant box is really nice. I've already sent an email to the author. I was like, well done, great, I love your product, thank you, it's free. All right. So the, the elk is initializing. Uh, what it actually ends up doing is it does uh, several different health checks. It restores its connection. It starts a pipeline. And what I want to see here is it installs the template for uh, setkcypy. Yes, I named my template setkcypy because it is the best name on the face of this earth. I think Joel is ignoring me right now. <laughs> so uh, I named my template after your product, Psychic Pi, uh, Y Pi, right there. So I actually found out how to finally get this template to register. Because every time you actually put anything in Elastic, you have to map it. And if you don't map it, uh, Elastic doesn't e either won't take the data at all, or it will take the data erroneously. So being able to do that, I had to play around with several different things. I built a tool to manually map for syslog. I also built a, uh, let me find the actual file here. Uh, here we go. So this is the pipeline for Logstash. What I did is I, I have two inputs, 5,000 for TCP and UDP. Then I have my grok filter where I actually go ahead and, and I'm sorry I didn't write this in front of all of you. My plan initially for this talk was to make this grok filter live. You don't want me to do that. We'll never leave here for a week. Um, okay, so we, you end up writing out all of your, your different fields, and you actually have to basically account for changes in the data, a not strongly typed log type, and you, you really have to either try and do that all in one line or have multiple lines that where you basically separate the object via comma and your line via comma. And so that way you can match multiple different types of messages that are fundamentally from the same system. So I, he has a JSON message, and this inevitably is where everything really got tough. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't interpret the JSON message. You have to actually not just map the JSON message, but you have to map a, a handler for the JSON message, so that way it takes all the fields. And I found that out today, approximately an hour before I got here. So it, I, I haven't done it. <laughs> Yeah, that was, that was a, a long crawl. By the way, the learning curve for an elk really is kind of like this, and I'm trying to make it a little bit more lateral for everybody. I'll do another one of these, I promise, and it'll run a lot more smoothly. Uh, anywho, so I, uh, I do several different checks of latitude and longitudes in there. I go ahead and try and seed that into location, and then I have the output where I go ahead and say, uh, if there's no failure, if there's no failure in the parsing, send it on to Elastic. And if there is a failure, it goes to errors. You can look at the errors, figure out what you broke, and go ahead and fix it. So I also go ahead and set the index, the document type, and the template, the template name. I force overwrite it and force manage template. Yes, you actually have to do all of this for Logstash to even be able to control Elastic. Are they made by the same company? Actually, they are. So. So further, I'm gonna go into one more thing in this. I think I'm getting a signal that I might be nearing my, oh, I gotta talk louder? Okay. So, uh, so in, the, in the template 
for Logstash, which by the way doesn't even follow some of the same syntax as the rest of the mapping that you use in other parts of this project. Uh, you go ahead and set the template to set KC Wi-Fi. Uh, you have to set order for one, I don't know why, but the mappings end up going in and you set each of the fundamental types. Here's where I tried to do some nifty sauce with the JSON just before we arrived here. It failed miserably, I am sorry Joel. Um, so the uh, <laughs> so then the source and, and so on. So anyway, so that is how you basically dual prong try and send from a, a very custom log stash uh, syslog basically type that doesn't exist yet into Elastic. So what I will do though is I will go ahead and show you the di pieces of the data set I was able to actually munch. So here is Here's a structured element from uh, from sec or for, yeah from sec KC YPI where uh, the it, it recognized the subhost. So I was actually using a, a, a tertiary log stash to go ahead and forward in. It was, uh, was kind of neat because my first log stash was actually what time's up? <laughs> All right, and so. You can actually see the, the elements here. The only thing I wasn't able to get, I have latitude and longitude, I wasn't able to quite see that location yet. So uh, I will revisit this and uh, I'll continue updating the project. Feel free to check it out. There's a CSV importer, a MySQL importer, a prototype API importer. The only one I didn't write is an XML importer. My apologies.